Here we've got a good calculus question. Uh, we've been given the function, the first derivative, and the second derivative. It was nice of them to give that to us. Uh, they didn't have to. They could have just given us the function. We could have solved for the first and second derivative. But there's a lot of stuff to find here, so I'm going to try and go quick so the video doesn't go too long, and it gives you an idea of how fast you should be able to do it on a test. So first thing, domain. The only thing we have to look out for is what value will make the bottom 0, because we can't have that. So we look at f of x, it's 2x over x minus 3, and it should be pretty clear that if x was 3, the bottom would go to 0. So the domain is x is an element of the real, so every x value except x is unequal to 3. And that's going to be a pretty common theme throughout this question. Range, there's no... Uh, there is an x on top, so there's no value that y cannot take on, so this is just y is an element of the reals. For our x, let's do our y-intercept first. So our y-intercept's really easy to find. Um, you just plug in 0 for x, so it's 2 times 0 over 0 minus 3, which is 0 over negative 3, which is 0. So we know, I'm just going to write off to the side here, our point zero, 0, that's going to be an x and a y-intercept. Um, and for your x-intercept, you also want to make the top 0, which is at 0, 0. So from this, we've got one point on our graph, and we know what our domain and range look like. Let's go on to critical points. So that was A. Let's go on to critical points, and then I'll erase, and then we'll end up putting everything together on the graph when we have to sketch in part G. Critical points are found where f prime of x equals 0. So let's set negative 6 over x minus 3 squared to equal 0. We can see that this can never happen because the only way a fraction is 0 is if the top is 0. Since it's negative 6 on top, that's never going to be 0. So there are no critical points. But this goes well with part C, which says find where it's increasing and decreasing. So we don't have any critical points, but we do know that the point 3 still makes this first derivative undefined. And you can see that's the same with the second derivative and the function. If you plug in 3 for any of those, the bottom's going to go to 0. So we have to put that on our number line. Now I'm going to place a number less than 3 into the first derivative. Uh, when I do that, the bottom's going to be positive, the top's still negative, so it's going to be negative. This is the first derivative. If I plug a number greater than 3, say 4, in the bottom of the first derivative, it's again going to be a negative over a positive, which is a negative. So this means that the function is decreasing everywhere. We know it's undefined at uh, 3, but on both sides the function is going to be decreasing. So we would say it's increasing nowhere. And if we wanted to write decreasing in... Um, in interval notation, I would write it's decreasing from negative infinity to 3, and then again from 3 to infinity, and it's undefined at 3. Let's pause. That's A, B, C done. We'll look at the second derivative for D and E. Okay, here we go with part D. So we're asked to find where it's concave up or down, and part E is the points of inflection. Those two go together as well. Those should be keywords that we think of the second derivative. So uh, concave up or down and points of inflection let's start with points of inflection even though that's part e and we're gonna set our second derivative to zero just like we did with the first derivative but now we call these points of inflection when this is zero once again this fraction can never be zero because there's a 12 on top you can think of it as multiplying the bottom to the other side and you get 12 equals zero which does not make sense so there are no points of inflection, I'll call them POIs, and even though that's sort of part of part E, but again, we want to know where it's concave up or concave down, so I'm going to put that 3 value on the number line. The reason, If we had a point of inflection, we'd also put that x value on the number line, but because we don't, we only put the values that uh, cause the second derivative to be undefined. Now I'm going to plug a number less, I'm sorry, that's cubed on the bottom, I'm going to plug a number uh, less than 3 into the bracket, say 2, and that would result in a negative number on the bottom, so that's going to be negative. But if I plug a larger number in, say 4 or 5, it's going to be positive on the bottom, and it's positive on the top, so the whole thing's positive. So that means we're concave down here. A negative second derivative means the function's going to be concave down. 
positive second derivative means the function is going to be concave up. So concave down from negative infinity to 3. And this will help with our graphing as well as it's a question for part D. And concave up. That's from 3 to infinity. Again, that's just because the second derivative is negative. That results in concave down function. Second derivative positive, concave up on the function. Equation of asymptotes before we, fun uh, before we sketch everything. Uh, let's do a horizontal asymptote first. Horizontal asymptote is found if the we look at the degrees of the numerator and the denominator. So our function is 2x over x minus 3. We can see the degree on top is 1. There's a power of 1 here that we don't write, and power of 1 on the bottom. When the degrees are the same, we just take the coefficients. So 2 and 1, 2 over 1 equals 2. So y equals 2 is going to be a horizontal asymptote. Perfect. How about a vertical asymptote? This is just found at the x value that makes the bottom 0, which we know is 3. So x equals 3 is our vertical asymptote. y equals 3 is our hor y equals 2, I'm sorry, is the horizontal asymptote. Again, that's just from the coefficients. Let's pause, put this all together, and sketch it. Okay, so we're going to now take everything that we've solved in parts A through um, F and plug them, and basically toss them on the axes, and hopefully we can sketch our function. As a reminder, we're actually sketching F of X, right? The first and second derivative were just used to help us find where it's increasing, where it's decreasing. So first I'm going to put on our asymptotes, because those really help to see it all. So our asymptote, our horizontal asymptote at y equals 2, vertical asymptote at x equals 3, and that's going to help us sort of frame our function. We also know that we have our um, our x and y intercept at 0, 0, and we know the function's decreasing, so we always know we're going to ride along these asymptotes, and it's decreasing, which means it's going down and to the right. As you read from left to right, it's always going down which means we must be up in this top right corner as it's always going to be going down after 3 as well, but now it's concave up. If you wanted a particular point here, I would plug in 4 into our equation just to get it a little bit more accurate, and that's on the other side of 3. So f of 4 is going to be 2 times 4 over 4 minus 3, which is just 8. So we know our point 4, 8. So here's 4. Let's say 8 is up here. It's going to be a point here. And that will help us sort of frame what it's going to look like. Again, I know it's shaped like this because it's concave up. You can see that, that sort of cup formation, uh, as well as it's still going down to the right because it's decreasing everywhere. So hopefully that helps. I know it was a bit long, but that puts all of the pieces together for sort of why we use the derivative, why we use the second derivative, and how we can sketch any curve using that. You can always send us more questions, info at arnoldtutoring.com. Thanks.